gardenculturemagazine.com on Instagram is the same thing, Garden Culture Magazine. They put all the knowledge you need into a magazine. It's available every couple of months from your local grow shop. If you want to save the environment like we all should, you go on to gardenculturemagazine.com and you look through all the blogs, the micro blogs. They've got a really nice website to be fair. And uh, you can look through all the digital articles on their website. Gavita International and Gavita North America are the two places you can find them on Instagram. Or go to the website, gavita.com. Budbox Grow Tents on Instagram and budboxgrowtents.com. I love it when everything's aligned, brand is on point and everything's just nice and easy. Go and see them for all your tent needs in silver or in white. Thick poles, always good quality tents. Fill a can of Erwin, can of filter, the can filter, Erwin underscore, canfilters.nl on Instagram and canfilters.nl on their website. Go and check them out for your intake, extraction, filtration, controls, everything you need to control your environment. Sunlight underscore LED, Sunlight UK for the Instagram pages and sunlight.com. Uh, they are, in our opinion, the best, most multifunctional, modular LED on the market. Have I just said something's the best? Ah, oh, fucking bastard. Well, that's just my opinion anyway. The Autopot, Autopot underscore global, Autopot cultivation consultancy. <laughs> Try to type on that one in one go. And they're online at autopot.co.uk. The system you need, gravity fed, no electricity, autopot.co.uk. Annika, Canada.uk.official on the Instagram and website is Canada-UK.com. All your nutrient needs in one place in www.land, the metaverse, the NFTs, digital. We're all going to be digital beings in the next two years. There you go. Right. I'll see you all after the break. All good. Ready to go. Turn my voice up a little bit. Oh, God, for everyone watching, the whole family. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to be in the house, in the house that I built, in the booth that I built? I know people tune in every Sunday to listen, but even when business is good, we still manage to do the podcast. <laughs> Right, this week is a special one, listeners. It's 234, podcast 234, with me, Steve, and... Rhea Green, Green Queen. The Queen, the Queen of Tornadoes, the Tornado Queen. How are you? (laughs) I'm all right, I'm glad. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I've listened to you for, well... I listened to you ages ago when I went to Canafest and I was like, oh, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> well, it's not about me today. It's about you and everything that you know about. We've been spying you on the 460 live and uh, you've got quite a few admirers from that, haven't you? Well, all my admirers have got to go via you. I didn't even you 20 years ago. You can filter them like a ninja. <laughs> yeah. Smack out the bad ones and just let the good ones through. I needed you 20 years ago, Steve. I know. Uh, everyone needed me 20 years ago. <laughs> You're a legend. So, this is the... Uh, well, this... yeah, this year, I've decided... This year, in fact, you have inspired me a little bit as well because I've been avoiding doing public stuff for ages. I've been trying to build for the brand and, to be honest, I've been a bit scared of doing um, of doing audio podcasts and stuff because I just don't know what I'm going to say and there's all the good stuff is all uh, incriminating so I've avoided saying anything for a while but I realised that this year is the year to be public and, and try and shape this narrative more because this is happening whether we like it or not and we've been doing the back work for such a long time if we don't get in there now and shove our elbows to get a space on the table everything's going to happen and it's not going to be what we want so this is the opportunity to really make people's voices heard yeah I think 2022 22 is my number 
we know we like our numbers. So it is, it's the year that shit's going to happen. So this is, this is podcast two, three, four. And we might call this the unplanned podcast because, uh, I wanted to get Vicky on, but because she's so busy, especially with the launch, which we'll talk about. And cause I'm reasonably busy. Uh, it's been hard to, to jump on and, uh, and I have an evening with the green queen herself. So. We'll talk about a few things. We'll probably go off on on different narratives, different tangents. But while we've got the listeners at an early stage, there's a few things that we need to announce. Firstly, you can follow Green Queen on Instagram at Green Queen Magazine. You can visit her website, greenqueenmagazine.com. Yep. Yep. And what the reason why you'll want to follow Vicky and the Green Queens is because they are shaping the narrative. That is their ethos. That is what they are about. They're about, uh, there's a, a, an image that we spoke about, uh, with Kali Seaman and it's about the legendary and the historic growers and people within the cannabis industry who have this whole industry on their backs and in certain countries where it's legal. Um, the corporations and the millionaires have stood on that ground that these people have built and are reaping the benefits. So Vicky and her team. Wow. The quote that, the quote that, um, a friend of mine from America used was the people who paved the way become the pavement. Yeah. And I've spoken to people from Canada and I've never heard the word PTSD being referred to so often as people that left the Canadian industry for the reason of investment money. And what happens is when it stops being an illegal product and it starts being, um, investable so all the old money the old the old oil money the old tobacco money just comes in and looks at it like an investment capital deal and what happens is they don't give a shit for the legacy people for the people that have done the groundwork for the patients it's just it's just profit driven it's just shareholders and the money that's involved in that is like it's just astronomical yeah. the figures that are being thrown around the canadian industry are crazy in the so have i got this right though that Green Queen's main mission, you've got many missions, such as empowering women within cannabis, uh, but the main mission is to shape, not change the narrative, but shape the narrative. Things that are going to happen are going to happen whether we like it or not, but your mission is to help guide it so that the people who should be benefiting at least benefit a little bit from uh, what will, maybe, and is about to come. Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The word authority means author. So we, the reason why an authority is the authority of the story is because they, it's the repeated story. Everybody agrees with the, 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 the narrative. So what is the narrative in this um, industry? And it's not necessarily like we want women to be better growers. Yeah, like encourage everybody. But more so, we want a feminine model. And what a feminine model is, it's circular, which means everybody's got something to offer the solution. Um, the, the men are lines, women are circles, you know, it's in their body. Men have got lines, women have got circles. So what that looks like from a, a male perspective is like competitiveness, competition, um, being the best, somebody being the hierarchy, somebody being the, the – that's the system we're in at the moment. It's like the teacher tells the class how they do it, the boss tells everybody you know, how things should be done. But as we're moving into like a more cooperative, collaborative space with – things getting just bigger than they, they can. Like workspaces now are global workspaces. People are working with people on the other side of the world that they've never met. And that's normal now to have these kind of massive teams and it's this collaborative model. And cannabis is a perfect opportunity to that everybody's everybody's view and everybody's narrative is relevant because nobody really knows all about this subject. There's not one expert in the country that you can speak to that knows everything about all aspects of this subject because it's just vast, you know. You, For example, you're a specialist in your area, but there's loads of areas that also have like hemp farming or patient access or um, testing or like there's, there's specialties within specialties. And it's like, how do we tell a story that's so complicated? And that's why I know I've uh, driven you crazy a little bit. We're trying to talk about everything. I think this is what's missing because like high time, soft secret, um, weed world, they've all got their place, but they're a niche within a niche. How do we talk about everything? How do we talk about hemp batteries at the same time as patients at the same time as growing? And it's, and it's difficult because it's, it's, you can't talk about everything all at once. However, if we can kind of be the soil of this project and we, it's almost like we're building a, an ecosystem. We're building like a rainforest. Everybody's got their place in the rainforest. And the thing is about nature is nature doesn't compete. It collaborates. 
everything in the rainforest has a job, the ants, the bird, the tree, the, the bacteria. And like that's what we're building. We're building an ecosystem that can support our community of everything, of growers, of patients, of hemp farmers, of people that don't even care about recreational cannabis but see, still see it's got a benefit. Even if it's like, for example, there's this whole push of stop, plant more trees. Well, why don't we just stop cutting down trees and use hemp instead to make all the stuff that we're making out of the paper? Those sort of common sense things, we want it to be acceptable to straight people. So we've tried to make the magazine as clean as possible so that academics, business people, government people, farmers can come on and it doesn't scare them by being too weed-focused. So we, we haven't really gone into weed flavours. That We've tried to just skim the surface and talk about the general how it affects society rather than being like we love weed. Obviously, we love weed, but we're trying to say it in a yeah. straight person way. So when you see the magazine, is this the this is the online where uh, your team write the blogs and they reach out to experts in the field and they write the blogs and the micro blogs and the political arguments well, on the website? Or Well, basically, a, li- a little bit about me was years ago, about 10 years ago, I had um, an event space called Truth Juice and we used to talk about alternative subjects. And we had loads of people that were challenging the law and they were doing things like going into court and not saying their name or contesting council tax and they were doing mad legal stuff and they were all turning up in the court and all the court staff had been really funny with them and I'd walk in and I'd say, I'm press and I'd walk past everybody and they'd go, certainly madam and they'd sit me at the front and give me a piece, give me a glass of water and it was like, it just made me realise the power of press and this is what the magazine, the reason why it came about was the power of press is massive because people want to talk to you. We can talk to the Green Party, we can talk to professors, we can talk to patients, and we've got access to things that otherwise were inaccessible. So that's why the magazine came about, to have this ability to put a press hat on and to be able to talk to anybody. Cool. So within your arsenal of... uh shaping the narrative which is we say that a lot don't we um you've got the, the website green queen magazine uh, and but you've also gone full 100 percent electric train ahead, electric train ahead with a few other little avenues one of them the big one being the yearbook the yearbook so the yearbook the reason why the yearbook is important is we're kind of in a digital book burning at the moment, like with websites going down and social media just like randomly closing down the sites. And those those sites take people years, do you know what I mean? Content that takes years to put together can just be closed down overnight. And cannabis is a high-risk um, high risk industry because of that. So how do we have a plan B? So we've tried to do many things all at once. The yearbook's important because I think that we've forgotten how nice it is to hold something in your hand and have a collectible. And the word magazine, when I first made the business, it really grated on me, to be honest. I was like, oh, nobody reads magazines anymore. Uh, There's an old hat, nobody bothers. So we wanted to make something that was like a collectible book, like a keepsake, like a time capsule of the year. And the idea being that it's a 10-year legacy project that's going to document the next 10 years. And if it changes in the same way as America has, it's going to be massive what, what the changes that we're going to be able to see so let's have like a time capsule of where we're at. And we've done it um, looking back. So it's set in the past straight away. So it's not going to get dated. The idea is it's a, um, if we have 10 years of this, this is a, this is, this is a documenting taking back the plant. This is a saying um, the plant affects so many different areas of life. It's not just weed smoking people and people who want to grow. It's like what happens when there's a hemp battery? What happens when there's, hemp biofuel or hemp buildings and all of that is part of the narrative so we we think it's worth documenting so correct me if i'm wrong (laughs) time capsule you feel like we're just on the cusp of something because of europe what's going on in europe germany is now legal for medicinal is it recreational as well in germany (laughs) You're allowed to grow. Well, what happens is generally they try and go medical first because they can set the price at medical price and then they can go recreational afterwards. And what's happening is we're in a really privileged position because we've seen how it's unfolded everywhere else in the world. And at the moment, the UK industry is like clay. It's soft. It's still shapeable. And I think this is our time to position 
celebrities of our industry. Like, who are the people who want to speak for, for our industry? And it's not necessarily the people who are speaking at the moment. And I think the the bridge, being the bridge between the hydroponic industry and the people, the grassroots, like the people who are actually doing stuff and know about the plant, how do we be a bridge so they can talk to the straight people? Because the straight people want it but don't understand it at all. Yeah. And they're the ones that are talking. I get yeah. So like in um, places like Malta, so there's we're, we're getting to see more and more European countries. Malta's now recreationally legal, isn't it? Or you can you can grow four plants in Malta. Well, the, the president of Malta come over to Cannabis Europa to say, "Come to Malta, we're open to investments." And they also had a conference um, where Acon did a crypto event there. Acon, like, like the rap Bitcoin singer. Event. Yeah. yeah, so Akon's really into Bitcoin. So he's an Af- he's African, and he's sent all the money back to Africa, and he's done like all this crypto infrastructure. So he's really big on crypto, and he he was there one of their main speakers in Malta, and they had a crypto conference next door to a cannabis conference. So Malta is well ahead of the game because they're looking at new ways to bring money into the economy. Okay, so this yearbook, um, it's going to be a collector's edition. Um, you're going to run a limited edition, a limited amount of prints per year. Uh, it's a time sort of, the first one's going to look back, it's going to be retrospective a little bit leading up to 2022 and including what's happened in 2021, a little bit of 2022. And then each year is going to be a snapshot of what happened in that year um, over the next 10 years, there's going to be one released every year. So when and where can people buy them from when they get released? So we are releasing on a separate site. So we're doing everything all together. So we're releasing uh, NFT, which is a digital art piece, on the 22nd of February. And then we're releasing the yearbook where you get a free NFT included. Um, and that's on the, about the 20th of March. And the reason why um, we're connecting the two is to have this link between the real world and the digital world because obviously NFT is a hot subject at the moment. There's all this stuff happening in the crypto space. And because they're so new, we're trying to create a digital and physical collectible that's going to have longevity. So I think um, the yearbook is going to grow because we're going to have more people want to be involved. It's, it's a concept at the moment. We can't, because nobody holds it in their hand yet, it still doesn't exist. I think hopefully this first project is going to show people that they do want to be an iconic part of this the year. They do want to represent themselves as something key that happened in this year. And hopefully as we build the yearbook over 2022, we're going to build partnerships, relationships with brands, with events. So the content's going to become more multimedia so we can record it. And also, we're going to include things in the yearbook. And um, we've also got a merchandise drop with the yearbook as well. Yep, so you get so nice bits of swag. Get, everybody loves freebies. I love I love a freebie. <laughs> I love, I've, I've been hard very much on the school run. Um, and it's really difficult to get people to recognize your brand. I mean, people in um, Spanabist and events like this spend under grand on a on a stand just to give people a free something or other and make a follow them on Instagram, you know? So I think this is a real big opportunity for brands to get something in their hand, especially hydro companies, because it's a nightmare to advertise. They don't want to connect with cannabis people, but they are, their demographic is cannabis people. So if we can solve that issue, we want to have a really sexy merchandise box. And hopefully, as the market changes in 10 years' time, we'll have everything in there. We'll have weed, we'll have dabs, we'll have rigs, we'll have pipes, we'll have everything in there. But at the moment, we've just got legal items, branded stuff, lighters, stickers. Um, and the idea is it grows, it grows, and it becomes more and more of a sexy thing. Yep. So what is the, if they buy the yearbook, uh, they'll get an NFT with it, but you've got 10,000 NFTs and these are the green queens. So what does it mean to own a green queen NFT? What does it mean to own a green queen NFT? Well, there's um, there's a lot of crossovers with the cannabis and crypto space at the moment. There's a brilliant, um, there's an NFT company that was launched last year called the Crypto Cannabis Club and they are the first ever NFT funded cannabis brand. So they did an NFT raise that um, funded their brand. And the idea is if we can get some funding through the NFT, we are going to 
spend it on content creation and we're going to have to stay independent because this has been one of the struggles from building the brand is like where do you bend over for um, the sponsors and how, where where's the morals lie and personally I deal with full plant extract medicine I think black market medicine works for cancer patients and I think these CBD companies that are selling CBD isolate products to cancer patients are they're not following the Hippocratic Oath, they're causing harm, you know, these cancer patients need full plant extract and they're confused, they don't understand what it is and I'm not up for representing brands that aren't aligned with my moral compass. So that's been one of the struggles and how do we stay independent and find advertisers and actually if we can do this NFT fundraiser, we don't need sponsors and we don't need to bend our morals and we can pay grassroots reporters to tell us the truth of what's actually happening. Okay, so that is that is the only reason anybody should need is uh, do you want to help shape the narrative of the legal cannabis markets in the UK, in Europe and globally? No, no, no. This is, this is one of the major things is we've got to stop asking for legal. We don't want legal. Legal is wrong. Legal is licensing prohibitation. It's growing without a license. If you look at America, if you look at Canada, you look at any of these legal jurisdictions – legalisation has damaged the industry more than anything and people are still going to jail but they're going to jail for growing without a licence instead of growing in a legal plant. So legalisation isn't what we want. We want decriminalisation. We want decriminalisation, destigmatisation and decentralisation. We want to give weed back to the people. Like it should never have been taken off them in the first place. So we, this is one of the main things about shaping the narrative is we're using the wrong word. Legalise is, is no, we don't want it legal. Legal is the worst thing that could possibly happen. It's part of the black. It's another way of them stealing the plant off us. It's going, oh, this is what you asked for. Now you've got to go to the home office and get a licence, and the licence is 150 grand, and you can't have it if you've got a criminal record. So we don't want legal. Legal is definitely not what we want. What we want is things like the outlaw. So the outlaw is on our um, fundraising for the uh, NFT. We're going to give him a percentage, and if we sell all of them, we're going to give him 100 bags. And the idea is, sue the police, like, sue the police. They have no right to take people's equipment. They have no right to take people's weed. And the outlaw did 150 cases last year, and he was successful with them. He got um, people's equipment back, people's weed back, and people were paid damages as well. So I think that's the approach we should take. And I think Just to, if we've got a platform, we can encourage disruption, you know? So to, in, so to be devil's advocate and... I've said several times my opinions on this podcast may not represent my own opinions, but let's play devil's advocate. Do you think, so the police's job is to uphold the law, isn't it? So whatever the law is, they've just whether they agree with it or disagree with it, they have to uphold it. So if we did shape the narrative, do you think it would be better to sue the police who are upholding what the government say is right and wrong, or should we sue the government? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or try like what? Do you think that's the right thing to do? Is because I I know there's there's places up and down the country now, maybe Durham, um, definitely down south. There's uh, the chief of police in those areas are saying um, we've got to do a job. However, we are not going to prosecute or we're not going to um, go after well, the people who remember, are going. Yeah, you've got to remember, the police haven't got any money. They've got no funding. All the police stations just shut. Like, if you remember, like, 10 years ago, they were doing four grows a day and taking everyone's equipment. They don't even bother taking your equipment anymore. They just cut the plugs off. They don't even do anything because they haven't got the resources. They haven't got the warehouse. They haven't got the time. They're grossly underfunded. They're all under pressure. And police just don't want to deal with it. It's a massive strain on resources. I think I read something that said, like, 2018, I think it was 85,000 prosecutions, was it? It was, like, the average prosecution was two and a half grand because it went through probation and stuff. And it cost the British taxpayers, I mean, like, two million in cannabis um, prosecution charges, like, going to court, dealing with a probation officer. And no one wants to deal with it because it's not profitable. Do you know what I mean? So... It's like kicking the can and everyone going, oh, I'm doing my job. But actually, a policeman's off, a policeman's job should actually be protect the people and be there to, if there's a breach of the peace. And if somebody's arrested for growing, who's, who's breached the peace? They haven't caused any, there's no injured party. So the other issue with 
um, cannabis being illegal is people getting robbed. So, so many people are getting robbed and they can't ring the police because they've got something illegal. So, there's some really dodgy stories of people getting robbed horribly, you know. So, by decriminalising, it allows this injured party thing. Like, if somebody comes and robs you because you've got to grow, you can ring the police. That's where you should be. That's where the police intervention should come in. And the thing is with cannabis is because it's so confusing with its categorisation, the police don't really know how to deal with it. The government don't really know how to deal with it. If you ring, if you're a hemp farmer and you ring the home office, they take months to get back to you and they say, oh, it's not this department, ring another department. Because nobody really, it doesn't fit under any department. So what I'm suggesting we do is we build a community that's strong enough and then we say, we are the council of the, of the we're the experts in the industry <laughs> and these are what we suggest should be the um, standard practices. So things like no PGRs in, in, um, in consumable products. No, um, and testing, I mean, testing is an option, but it's not a necessity. But if people want to go into testing, testing should be accessible so people can test their flower and say what it is. Um, but really, the main point is somebody growing weed in their attic has got no different to GW growing weed in their dodgy, in their dodgy greenhouse. Full of spider, mate. I know. <laughs> Well, are you just about to take the words out of my mouth? I know people that have been in there, and I'm sure it's probably the same person, and they've said, if that was somebody's attic, you'd rip them to pieces, but it's a £100 million greenhouse, you know? Yeah. And because they're not having no care in it, and they don't understand it, the thing is about growing is, if you give it to somebody who loves it, they give you a nice product. If you give it to somebody who doesn't give a shit, doesn't smoke, and just wants to earn money out of it, it's mediocre at best, you know? If you, if you want really nice weed, it's somebody who really loves weed. Yeah. So... GWs isn't going to do it. So if that's the case, we need to open it up and say, look, the straight people out there that think medicine comes from the doctor and it's in a bottle and it's come, and it's just GW spider mighty weed that's been processed and put in a clean tub. But you've got some geezer down the road who's skin, who's got a bad back, grows the best weed in town, and he's got wants to sell some weed as well. What's the difference? Yeah. Like, there isn't what, any difference. Do you want to open my eyes because... Uh, I am, my opinion is pro decriminalization. Uh, I can't wait for it to become decriminalized in the UK because I believe in the medicinal benefits. Um, and the point I was going to make has floated away out of my brain. <laughs> and I can't remember what the point was. It'll come back to me. Let me go to my other point that I was going to make. That, and now I've remembered the first point I was going to make. So what's really open my eyes is and it's and it's scary and it's upsetting is the last two years that C word that we don't like to say anymore because it's fucking fed up of saying it um, the, I see people driving in the cars by themselves with masks on now I'm not going to get into the subject of whether you should or shouldn't wear a mask or everyone has their opinion and everyone's entitled to an opinion and if you're not harming anybody else, then it is what it is. But people who wear masks in the car, in their own cars, when they are by themselves driving from one place to another, has shown me how manipulated the government, the media can, the, uh, the impact it can have on people's lives. The story, who's telling the story? And it just shows this past couple of years have showed how powerful it is to change the narrative, you know, they've changed, oh, don't stand by somebody, don't touch them. But actually, like, I'm a practitioner, I'm a house practitioner for 20 years, I studied aromatherapy when I was 19, I used to grow weed, and I just studied everything. And um, ironically, aromatherapy is actually the closest turpine, um, closest to a turpine degree. I'd want to do a degree in turpine specialist one day when it's available. But um, the thing is about the story is, you need somebody to reflect another part of the story from you. So what we used to do talks about things like 9-11, chemtrails, um, sacred geometry. We used to do really alternative talks. And what happened was, as pe I thought in my ego self, I was like, I'm going to explain to everybody this information. But actually what happened was everybody used to drink tea and smoke weed outside. And that's when the magic could happen because it would be a reflection from... I've had this waking up or I've had this thought process and I've got no one to talk to about it. And now I've found this other person who's like me and they, they're reflecting back the same opinion. And I think this is why they've broken down society, not just 
the past couple of years, but close down all the pubs. Like the pubs are where the revolutions happen because people sit down and they talk to each other. And now everyone's doing it through Facebook and getting fact checked. And there's less and less places where you actually sit down with your people and you get on a level. And I think cannabis, for me, I think brings a lot of um, remedies to the situation at the moment. One of them being self declaration. So if I've got a bad back and I choose to take cannabis for my bad back, why do I need a doctor to tell me I've got a bad back when he doesn't know nothing about cannabis? And this is where you get into the legal arguments. If it's legal, like in wherever, you have to go and pay 20 bucks to get a medical card. But you still need a third party. So what cannabis says, is it, this whole cannabis argument, human rights argument, whatever, it's self-declaration. And what it says is, look, it's my body and I want to use this substance to make me feel better and I don't have to explain it to anybody. And that's the same argument of like, I choose to have this medical intervention or I don't choose it. It's my body and no one can tell me what to do and I don't need you to tell me whether I can or can't because I'm a sovereign being. I've got, and then the other argument is children. Like the children, I mean, I had a, I had a job interview with this woman. I met her in the cafe and she said, what do you, why do you do what you do? And I started crying about this epileptic, I had to write a story about this um, epileptic little boy and I was writing it late night and I was doing the research and I was like, they're having a hundred fits a day. And I just went into a moment of like, what would you do if your kid was having a hundred fits a day? And then this medicine helps them. And what happens is because they're having the legal medicine and it's high CBD, they get relief. So they get they get this response that's amazing. They fit stuff. But they only start for like eight to ten weeks because then what should happen in nature is you have the next batch. The next batch has got a different turpine profile. They respond differently and it works again. But because they're asking for standardized medicine, the, the, the kid stops having a response. So all of a sudden you get eight weeks of, oh my God, my life's back to normal. And then all of a sudden all the fits come back and, the, and they're going through yeah. this terrible time. And, so, so what sorry. you're saying, that's right. That's right. So what you're saying is the, the body becomes used to and accustomed to the prescription that they've got. And then. In nature, you would never get the same or you would never get an exact replica of the plant and the body would have to keep on guessing. But with prescriptions, well, your body just gets do, used to it. Let me do a little bit. Let me do a moment of aromatherapy, yes. Yeah. So when I studied aromatherapy, how it worked. So the terpines present in cannabis are they're the same. In, so anything with an aroma has got a terpine. So obviously lavender, lemon. And that's why you get lemony weeds that taste like lemon because they've got the same lemon turpine as lemon oil. And they, they exist in loads of different things in nature. So when a client comes in, you read what they've got and you give them a blend. So say you give them lavender oil, lemon oil, peppermint oil. You give them three drops of each. Next time they come back, because their body is used to that ratio, you change it. So you give them three drops, four drops, two drops, say, yeah? And the reason is, is the tolerance changes there and they get the same effect again so they still get high results so in nature my understanding is every time you get another batch of weed because obviously you know slight environmental changes mean it's a slight turpine profile difference every time even if it's the same plant in the same room the same everything yeah so nature's intelligent healing has naturally slightly varied the turpine profile on the next batch so we've got a constant um refresh of, of our tolerance on it the same way as if you smoke a different weed to the one you've been smoking, it gets you stoned in a different way. The variation is, is relevant. So nature's like in its intelligent healing has already solved this problem. But because we're demanding batch tested a pharmaceutical standard that are always the same every time, you don't get that variation. But if you speak to cannabis people, they'll tell you that. But if you speak to medical people, they don't understand because they just want it to fit a pharmaceutical model. So this is where the voice of the underground is really important because it's affecting patients, you know? Yeah, that, this this makes quite a bit of sense to me, actually, because for, on a few different levels, so a few points I want to make. Um, my background, people who've been a long-term listener, is science. Uh, technically, aromatherapy doesn't do very well in science because it's very hard to prove certain things. However, what I'm here to say is just because science can't prove it doesn't mean um, that it's not. Uh, it's not worthwhile. So what I would say is aromatherapy uh, or specifically smells are very, very um, prevalent in memories. So you'll experience this if you 
I wear an aftershave uh, and, I'll, and I'll wear different aftershaves through the years. When I was 18, it used to be dupe. So when... If I ever go, boy. I was a cheap boy when I was eighteen. It was gorgeous, and whenever I go, if I ever smell that again, I have literally can get flashbacks of being out in town with me mates, getting pissed, and being out in town. And there's actual proven science that says if you are studying for an exam, if you have the same scent when you're researching and learning. And you put that sense when you do the test, you're actually better able to recall the information that you've learned and that's proven. So uh, aromatherapy... Well, aromatherapy is actually... The, aromatherapy is really well accepted scientifically. They love them in France. They put them in the hospitals in France. They're antibacterial. Have you ever heard of thieves oil? Which oil? Thieves oil. Thieves oil. Like, yeah, like, have you ever heard of it? Nah, nah. So thieves' oil was a rat was made in the plague, yeah. So basically, all the thieves were robbing the rich houses because no one would go in the houses because everyone was dying of the plague and no one would go near the bodies. And then they invented this aromatherapy oil mix that's like cinnamon, rosemary, lamb, um, clove, uh, lemon. It's got five different oils in, and they were putting them on handkerchiefs and um, going into the places that had the dead bodies and not getting the plague and robbing the houses. So it's called thieves' oil. So thieves oil is actually like tested in tested by robbers. But <laughs> aromatherapy oils are big, and aromatherapy oils. This is the thing about cannabis is it fits beautiful with, with all the other subjects that are already really highly researched. So the aromatherapy oil stuff, th- there's already been the research on it, and the turpine stuff. I mean, it's you could spend your whole life learning about one oil, you know, and then you start dealing with like the boiling temperatures, the extraction methods, the the heat that you you whether it's dry whether you're juicing it like there's so many variables to how you extract yeah. cannabinoids it, it fast you know mind blowing the the other thing that I, so aromatherapy and science so because there's a lot of people who listen who they like me big on the science they go huh, aromatherapy but it definitely does have its place in my opinion um the other two things I was going to say is like you like we've just said about in nature and terpenes and um, cannabinoids change on the same plant, but just different environmental conditions and pharmaceutical grade is, stays the same. I know the benefits of pharmaceutical grade and you can give this, but in research, it's really important because you can give the same, uh, compounds over and over again, then test them double blinded and placebo. We can get really good research. Yeah, but why? But why? The thing is about science is there's a point where like it just becomes so expensive. So if you're talking about placebo, neg- double blind trials, that have got this, like actually loads of people are suffering and just giving cannabis. Like they're talking about like some of the harsh medicines they're giving, for example, epileptic kids. Like, there's kids that have to have liver and kidney function tests before they take the medicine that they're going to give them about the epilepsy. And cannabis helps, but because the research hasn't been done because they're trying to do these 100 million pound studies. And the reason why they can't do the 100 million pound studies is because what they'll prove is cannabis helps this ailment and they can't patent the cannabis that they say uses the ailment. Mm. So the research they'll do will work against them. No pharmaceutical company is going to do that yeah, do unless know, they can patent the cannabis. What, what's good though is, uh, I can't remember what the, the term is, but there's a specific term when things are getting tested. And if you run a double blind placebo trial, um, the monitor the placebo group, so the group that I've got nothing, a sugar pill, and they monitor the group that are taking the actual active ingredient. And if the difference is that stark, they legally and morally and ethically have to stop the test because it is not in the best interest of science or the patients on placebo to, to carry on taking placebo. It's actually damaging them. If it's that obvious, they stop the trial and say, no, we're, it's ethically not right to you because you've got to go through I've ethics committee. I've got a conspiracy theory. Do you want to hear it? Go on then. Okay, so to do a to do a isolate. So if they do an isolate trial, then they can they can talk about what. But it's millions, billions to do an isolate trial, and like you say, they'd have to stop. Yeah. Where did spice come from? Where did spice come from? It's a synthesized Synthetic, THC. Yeah. If they wanted to do that trial. In real life, they cost them billions. But all of a sudden, a massive flood of the market happened. Synthesized THC, where did it happen? In jail. 
What a perfect clinical environment to do tests. They were calling them ambulance every day. People were dying of THC isolate, whether it's in spice, mamba. Now, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, but if that was a trial that they wanted to do, they would not have the clearance to do it. But the perfect environment would be to test it in jail. What does it look like to give TB THC isolate? Because that is what they want. That's the holy grail because they can synthesize it. They can mass produce it. It fits in the pharmaceutical model. They can patent it. They can do patented combinations to treat ailments specific. But actually, nature's already done it. It's like basically we've fucked everything. We've fucked the environment. We've fucked our body. We've fucked our ecosystem. We've fucked everything. And nature's gone. Here's a plan that can solve all the problems. And there's all these people in suits trying to steal it and take it off us and say, you can't use that, it's dirty, but you can use this pill that's clean. And it's like, isolates are not clean. Isolates, there's people in America that are having allergic reactions to CBD products. Like, no one has allergic reactions to cannabis, but you can't consume. If you eat enough carotene, then you'd die. But you'd have to eat 10 tons of carrots to eat enough carotene. But if you're taking carotene tablets, you can overdose on it. It's the same with, with isolate products. Like, in nature, it doesn't isolate... Nature doesn't isolate things. Nature gives it you complete with all the other cannabinoids. Even if there's only tiny, tiny traces, there's a reason why it's there. Like you can overdose on vitamin D supplements, but you can't over. You can get some bits, but you can't overdose on vitamin D through sun exposure because the body just stops synthesizing it. Well, it's just, this is what happens when we're concentrating things to such a level, and this is why it's patient driven because the patients go, "Don't do that. That's too strong. Do that instead, or don't." use a concentrate, use a, an infused oil instead, or like, there's other options. It doesn't all have, and the thing is, people are just trying to rinse this environment. It's like we've got, it's, without being over dramatic, it's like we're trying to rape and pillage what we've got. It's like the solution's there, and we're just trying to go, how can we rinse the life out of it? It's like, we don't need to, we just need to like respect it and nurture it and support it, and it'll give us everything. Mm. You know what I might do? I might do a bit of research into the gold rush and see what the prospectors used to do before the gold rush and see what their industry was like. And then when there was the gold rush, the money got involved and what it did to people's lives. Cause now they believe that there's about, well, there is the green rush, rush in America uh, and there's potentially going to be the green rush in Europe and, and the UK. Well, I'm doing a talk in Mexico. At this cannabis, I'm doing a, I'm doing a crypto conference talking about cannabis. I've been trying to work out my angle on it. And if you go into the crypto stuff, it's all about, in 1913, they stole the money because of the gold back. They took the gold off the backing of the coin and the Federal Reserve was made and they just basically made money out of thin air. So by stealing the gold, they stole the money. But at the same time, they stole the weed. They made weed illegal. Up until then, you had to plant an acre of weed, all, ha- all paper was, all canvas, all the sails, all the ropes, everything was made out of hemp. And what happened was the oil industry come in and said, no, don't use that. Henry Ford made a car that was run on hemp, that was made from hemp, and all of a sudden hemp just disappeared. And it's like it's a plant. You can't make a nature illegal and still be free. There's a reason why they stole it. And what would it, what would the world look like if instead of using petrochemicals, we used hemp? What would it look like if we used biodiesel instead of petrol and we didn't have all this carbon rubbish? What if we didn't use um, petrochemical... But, um, chemical sprays and all the agriculture things and we use hemp. Hemp can literally do everything. And what we've done instead is we've gone down the route of plastic and look where plastic's got us. There's microplastics everywhere. Plastics are affecting our hormones. They're killing the sea. There's a plastic deposit that's the size of Africa. It's like all of this is because they stole hemp off us. So if we can get it back and we can start putting hemp in a 3D printer, we can start building out of hemp. Hemp is the most amazing, versatile material that does everything. And not only does it do everything when it's finished, while it's growing, it helps. I mean, like, growing indoors is great, but if we can start really growing hemp outdoors, that's when the real solutions happen because not only have we got this material that we can use for everything, we've also got um, a six- to eight-foot plant that goes down with a taproot that's six- to eight-foot deep that pulls all the soils up to the surface, it rectifies the soil damage, it neutralizes glyphosate, it rebuilds heavy metals, it stops toxic overload. They planted it in Fukushima because it was toxic. Like hemp is a wonder plant, and it's all of this is because they've criminalized it. And I think 
the point I'm trying to make at the talk is saying that was a key point in history that they stole from us. If we if they hadn't have stole hemp from us, we wouldn't have these massive plastic problems that we've got now. Sounds. You've sort of, I know we work together as well uh, with Green Queen, but you've sort of, a, a switch has suddenly gone in my head a little bit about what it means to own this Green Queen NFT. <laughs> and um, I need to, you need to pretend you're on podcast with me when we're just talking client to uh, business because it's sort of a switch has gone in my head where if you own I know the type of person you are and I know that when you sell these NFTs it's not like suddenly woo Vicky's gonna have private jets and eat at the five star Michelin hotels it's gonna be I know for a fact you're gonna give back to the community so what it means to own a green queen NFT is you have played your part in shaping the narrative of cannabis within uk and europe so if you buy if you buy and own a green queen nft when they're released on the 22nd of february you have played your small part in helping to shape the narrative and this is possibly i think it sort of dawned on me how big this potentially is this is one of the only ways that you can literally shape the narrative like how else are you going to do it one voice alone is not good enough this is like 10,000 voices <clears throat> all singing together. You make your the donation. Universe. Exactly. You make your donation <laughs> to the universe. You make your donation. You own your NFT, which will, funnily enough, go up in value when people become aware of this movement. Well, the thing, so the thing is about the, so the crypto space, yeah, there's a couple of things to mention. It confuses people because everyone's confused about money, you know, everyone's confused about value, but money. So in 2010, I had a bit of a um, head spin about money. So basically, up until then, I was growing in my house and I was like, oh, I want to fuck off somewhere. I want to go somewhere hot. And I gave my house to my little mate. I was like, yeah, you'll be sound, set up. A week in, he's gone and bricked his ex-girlfriend's windows and got the door kicked off and everything's got pear-shaped in my house. So, I basically left everything and I wrote a letter to everybody saying money doesn't exist unless you can prove that the money was sent to me. Like I had 40 grand worth of credit cards, I had two mortgages. I was like, yeah, I'd like, um, I'd a breakdown, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but I went on it and I went to, I went to, I went to Birmingham Jewelry Court. I was 10 grand and said, I want to buy some silver. And he gave me 11.11 .11 kilos of silver with a paperweight that said, um, a man's toil is not what he's, a man's toil is not rewarded by his worth, but rather by what he becomes by it. And I think from doing all the things I've done, there's something that's past money because when it gets to a point when you've got enough money, it becomes like purpose. Like I want to do something for a reason. I want to do something that's more important than me. And then I went off and drunk loads of ayahuasca and I mixed with some really high profile people, like proper money people, people that I'd never have mixed like in normal life, like the vice president of Burberry and Hollywood stars and like proper money people, London people. And it just shows that actually sometimes when you get that much money, it's a hindrance as well. Like people that are trustafarians, they're like, oh, I don't know who my friends are because they just want me for my money. So money isn't about money, it's about value. And this is where the crypto community come in years ago because they were saying what we want is a way to trade with each other and recognize each other's value. So about 10 years ago, they had like this mad platform that was like, if you're a yoga teacher, you can swap it for a car, for a mechanic to fix your car. And it didn't work because there wasn't enough people on there. But the idea was like sweat equity, like people swapping stuff rather than using money. And it was just ahead of its time. And the thing is about money is money's fucked at the moment. They've printed more money than ever over the past two years and it's about to crash. So crypto is like on the fringe and crypto really exploded with Silk Road. And Silk Road was a marketplace where people sold weed and other things. But like weed was like 20% of the marketplace as weed. And it was an ecosystem that was could have been tokens. It's the same as when you go into a pub and you buy a raffle ticket and they give you a pint of beer. It's because they recognize that as one beer, but they haven't got a license. So tokens and currency aren't necessarily money. People are buying things thinking, oh, this will go up in value. But actually what people want is just a way to trade with each other. Perfect example. Is the hydro industry at the moment? All of them are getting their arses kicked with banking. I was speaking to somebody the other day who said that a shop owner had to get their client to buy them a car because they couldn't take the cash. 
it's getting ridiculous and they're all like shitting themselves having their bank closed down tomorrow so there's a system that's needed imminently that if everybody accepted it it wouldn't matter whether it was a raffle ticket or a token or a it doesn't matter it just needs a way of flowing between each other so that you can all start paying your wholesalers and the customers paying this so I think that there's a space between the cannabis and the crypto industry where there's a partnership that hasn't really been utilised yet because the thing is about the crypto people is they've just done it. They haven't asked for permission. They've just built it in the background and then no one's paid any attention to them until now it's got multi-billion pounds worth of money in it. But actually, the real crypto people, they're trying to make an ecosystem. They're not about earning money. They're trying to just make something work, pay the programmers, pay the developers, build the community. The truth is the community. And cannabis community is really strong because it's not about money. Not saying that no people don't want to earn money, but it's about something more than that. Like people are in this for something deeper than money. And that's what we're trying to attach with this. It's more like a membership card. And then what happens is, you, so for example, if you look at like racial groups, like Indian people or Jewish people, they don't spend money outside their community. If they want a plumbing job, they get a family member, a friend of the family, anybody who's Jewish or Indian, and they never go out of their system. And it's not racist. It's brilliant because what it does is it, keeps the money in our system and it keeps the money flowing around our own community but what we're doing is we're taking the money giving it to Tesco's or Asda or I think 85% of our money is spent in five shops and it goes goes to Tesco's and then it's gone and then we've got to go and find it again if you recirculate the money around your same community everybody gets the worth out of that, that money and this is what the this is what the crypto space is it's an ecosystem we're building an ecosystem because we need to trade with each other doesn't matter what it is that we're trading and the thing is about weed is it's a commodity that people use and want to rebuy every week every month most things are just being stored they're like oh I'll, I'll buy it and keep it and it'll go up well that's not currency that's hoarding that's the reason why we've got the problem what you need is people spending it and flowing it and earning it and keeping the ecosystem flowing that's currency and that's why web 3.0 is going to be so huge and game-changing it's massive and it's really hard to be ahead of the game because no, there's no one to talk to. <laughs> Poor Steve has been, <laughs> Poor Steve what, has been battered with random what I will say about, voice notes. Yeah, what I will say about Vicky is I, I consider myself quite ahead of the curve. Um, we look to the future, we look at future trends. I like podcast. It is my best example uh, that I can give. We started podcast in 2014. It seems weird to say it now because people are like, yeah, everyone podcast, everyone's got a podcast in 2014. Nobody knew what a fucking podcast was. And I knew that radio was going to come back. Essentially, this is what it is. It was media owned by independents that can get to the masses and people want an easy life. Voice activated gadgets they're huge alexas you speak to it your tellies you speak to it and just making people's lives easier so podcasts i could see that they were going to be huge and thankfully we jumped onto that sort of trend and it's took off massive for us but um what i will say about vicky is she's even a little bit further ahead where she's like crazy cat lady uh, too far ahead <laughs> <laughs> i'm like vicky i believe in you but just give me some time for it to float about and you've got like a million ideas they're all great um, and it's just they're uh, channeling all and that the energy thing, into the one thing the other thing that's the driven you all crazy is I've brought in this crazy woman whirlwind energy that's like let's talk about everything all at once <laughs> so you're like no <laughs> but I think what we're doing is we're weaving so the, in, I went to Colombia a couple of years ago and um, what happens in Colombia in the ceremonies is what used to happen is the men sit around the fire and the men the men talk and they talk about what they want to do with the community and the village or what what they're doing. And the women all sit around the, around the edge and they weave and they weave the words to remind the men what they've said. And what the elders say now is they say, we've got so confused. The women, everybody needs the medicine. Like we're all so confused. We all need to remember what we're doing. Like we forgot that our role here is sacred. Like, we're the caretakers. We're meant to take care of each other. We're meant to take care of each other, our family, the land. And what's happened is we've, we've fell for this delusion that we can just keep taking and we can just forget our friends. And it's like the American dream. It's like just build yourself up and you'll find new friends. It's like that's not the way community works. You've all got to come up together. So I am the best at spending money. 
<laughs> and I want to redistribute it to the community. So if we sell 100% of the NFTs, I'm putting 100 grand into um, Outlaws Legal Service. And some documentaries. Why? Because I think, <laughs> I, think the, I, I think the proper dude, I just I just want to kiss his ass a little bit and be like, let us record you and let us have access to your legal team. Let us talk about your precedent cases. Because at the end of the day, what are we going to do? Whose lead are we going to follow? And we've, so we've reported this year, we've reported the CAN card, we've reported the, um, the outlaw stuff, we've reported the Medicam. And they've all come against different obstacles, so we need to report them all at the same time because this is like a growing wisdom. So somebody said to me ages ago, you've got wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is like the forest that keeps growing. Wisdom's like a relationship with your kids. They just keep teaching you, you know. But knowledge is like a book. So it was printed at that time. It's got the knowledge of that time. If you get a 100-year-old dictionary, it gives you the words from that time, you know. So... What we need to do is both. We have the living wisdom of the site and the podcast and the interaction and more film. And then we have the knowledge that's the snapshot, which is the yearbook, which is the collectible, which is the vintage, which is you a part of the movement. And then along with the NFT, we're going to start giving more and more bonuses. So one of the bonuses is, uh, again, poor Steve got passed it to give, it, give us a discount, Steve. Give us a discount, Steve. So Steve is going to give us 20% if you spend over a grand on a credit card. Um, for t- for NFT holders, and so that means if you are buying over a thousand pounds worth of uh, grow equipment every year, it works out. You might as well just get the NFT to get the discount. Um, and also we're going to link it up to events. I've been on Product Earth case; they're going to put some sort of um, access for ticket holders. And we're trying to build this ecosystem so we can benefit everybody. So we want to give bonuses. Eventually it's going to be weed brands and dab rigs and all of these other bonuses, but we need to build in the community and we need them to feel safe. So the community is, the idea is a a layer of anonymity. So patients can talk about it. To be honest with you, the hydro industry is the hardest people to get to talk. Nobody wants to talk. It's, It's the golden days. And, um, I think if we don't start talking, we're going to have some dickhead who's going to speak for us Mm. and they don't know what they're talking about. So this is the time to step forward and be part of something that shapes the narrative. I know personally some of these hemp representatives that have had like the government body speak to them. Somebody had a Thai government representative ring him up to ask what they should do about the hemp legislation in Thailand. This is how new the industry is and how people haven't got a clue. So... Part of the reason why the magazine was made was to be a platform for our own community of who we want to showcase of, of people that we want them to be the voice for us. And you, Steve, you're a celebrity, man. Come on over. And I think that the knowledge that you've got is grossly underestimated because you're talking to other experts. When you talk to people who are starting from zero, like you're Steve Jobs. Do you know I mean like you're, no. you know everything? My hero, Steve and I Jobs. think we need to. Have... <laughs> but I think it's important, and I also think that we also need to kind of like help each other. Like, you're gonna have to hold my hand a little bit. Don't go on, Vic. You can, you can do another podcast. Go and speak to them. You were really yeah. good. A couple of kung fu, kung fu panda voice notes, but also like people like Simpa and Dr. Callie and. Everybody needs support in a different way. Like Dr. Kelly is really brave because she's talking about it from like a personal health perspective as well. And we need to encourage that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they're going to lead the way for other doctors and other professionals. You're going to lead the way for, in the hydro industry. And like, we need to just be brave, you know. Yeah. So the yearbook, you get an amazing yearbook with loads of boss goodies and the NFT. So if you're not really sure what NFTs are or how it's going to benefit you, just buy the book and you get the NFT and you get loads of boss goodies and you get an amazing yearbook. And if you are one of the future thinkers and you can see trends before they're about to happen and you are a proactive person, then you can buy the NFT on the 22nd of February, uh, greenqueenmagazine.com and you will have played your part in shaping the narrative and you can hold that NFT up in 10 years time saying I was one of the pioneers 
I believed in the industry. I have this NFT. I was part of the movement. And that's what it's all about. I actually saw all the crypto punks. I was on the internet looking at crypto punks at the time. You know, the, the first NFT, the ones that have gone for like stupid money. And I remember seeing it and it was like all this code. And I was like, oh, I can't be arsed for that. They're worth like half a million pounds, some of them. Like, and I just couldn't be bothered. I know. So there is a thing about putting the effort in like... It is. And I think there is a crossover between this space. The other thing is a shout out to any brands. So if any hydro companies want to put stuff in the box, the reason why we've done this box is because it's discreet. I know you all grow tomatoes and you don't want to be connected with uh, cannabis products. Well, in the UK, Vicky, in the UK, it's, uh, as you know, it's illegal to grow cannabis and it's re- these products are really good for growing herbs, vegetables, fruits, and I'm sure these companies would love to be associated uh, with allowing people to access medicine but at the moment it's it's not allowed so they don't promote it for that use they don't allow it for that use but if it was allowed and i know that uh, a lot of people are for the medicinal cannabis movements and they would fully get behind it but um just with laws you have to be very careful so it's it is tough one isn't it well i remember i remember so i was in the growing i actually was in the hydro industry from when i was 15 i used to go in my school uniform and stick the labels on at my mate's uh, hydro shop um and play snooker in the back room and um i remember when everybody got nicked there was like 45 companies that all got raided because they were giving cannabis advice and it caused no end of problems for loads of people about 10 years ago now and maybe longer and i think Rightly so, the hydro industry is 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 in the shadows. Because why would you want to rock the boat? Boat, you know, this is perfect situation. It's they've had a boom in a couple of years, but if we don't present ourselves now, we're going to get pushed aside. And and the money that's coming in from Canada, I mean, like, I know about four, three investments. One was forty three million pound for a um, beauty distribution racket. One was eighty one million pound for a grow, and one was forty five million pound for a hydro. Um, set up. So if you're talking about these sort of numbers, even though the, the hydro industry is booming, if we don't position ourselves with an organised voice, it's going to happen the same way it's happened in America, same way it's happened everywhere else. And the idea is we can have this stealth voice of the industry and we can shape the narrative and we can speak to MPs and we can speak to university professors and stuff, but we do need a bit of support. So Give us a shout. If any companies want to come and talk to me, give me a shout. I'll, uh, I'm always happy to send a voice note. <laughs> <laughs> we know that you love your voice notes. Uh, Vicky, I know you've got another yeah. uh, jump or call, podcast, yeah. video call, Instagram, whatever it is you're doing, in the lead up to the magazine, the book, the NFT release. You've got Mexico on Friday. Got Mexico on Friday. Arriba, arriba. <laughs> so good luck with that. Um <laughs> So remind everyone, Instagram is at Green Queen Magazine. Um, website is greenqueenmagazine.com. Yeah, the NFT is being sold on greenqueenmarketplace.com. And so the, that's where they can buy the book. There's going to be a real secret community where you only welcome if Vicky allows you, and it's going to be on Discord, and it's going to be huge. Oh, uh, so we are, so a little bit, I've got a confession, it is a little bit old lady, I don't really understand it as well as I could do, but Discord is the plan B, it's where we need to think about where we're going to go if social media gets shut down. So if you've got any gamers that are listening that are all Discord ninjas, come on over to the Discord channel and come and like talk to us because at the moment we're just talking the wrong channel. Be an admin. Probably, like trying to get me down to get on Instagram. Yeah, be an, so be an admin ninja. What do you call come them? Come and be an admin ninja on our Discord. What's we the, really uh, appreciate it. What's the word that they use on Discord? A moderator? Be an admin moderator at Discord ninja and uh, and help Vicky yeah, out. Yeah, men say you're just working the lingo. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> You can come and talk to me and say and go hi, and then it'll take some while to respond. We are, we are, and also if uh, if you don't have a, uh, if you're still skeptical on faith in Vicky and what she's going to do, uh, just remember this as a takeaway: Vicky invested in Bitcoin in 2013, <laughs> so she knows what's going to trend. I did. Uh, you know what? I spent. I cashed in. Don't tell all Bitcoin to go to Peru. 
I sold it, I sold it. I bought silver, I'm a dickhead. It's a sad story, don't tell them, it's like the same story. I'm just going to spend money, I'm just being <laughs> It's nearly as sad as the story you, saw, you gave a Bitcoin to buy a pizza. And that pizza is the most I expensive to, pizza ever mate, sold today. I went to my dad, yeah, this is, a, I went to my dad in 2011 with six grand and said, I want to buy a Bitcoin, they were 20 quid each, yeah. My dad said, you're a dickhead, you need to get a job, this is your problem. And, he didn't, and then when he bought silver, he said, so don't listen to me, I'm not an investor, I'm not a doctor, I'm just trying my best. 2011, fucking hell, £20 a Bitcoin. Fu- the future, the f- what do you call them? The future seer. A se- she's a seer. I try. <laughs> I'm, I try. But you know what? I think, I think we're in a really privileged position here and the UK has got something really good to offer to the global market. And we know we've got really good weed. We know we've got really good genetics. We know we've got a really strong underground movement. We can't talk about it just yet. But we can build the relationship, position ourselves, build the community, and then we're poised and ready because at the moment we're a bit of a laughing stock in the rest of the world. They don't if you go to America and go, I'm from England, they go, Hi. So let's let's change that, you know, and this is how we start tapping away at it and things like Product Earth, they're doing a brilliant job and the UK's up and coming, so and you guys, you guys are really setting the stage for like our level of excellence. Some of the, the hydro companies, auto parts and stuff are really Representing the UK really well, you know. PGR free. That was my campaign. It was something I wanted to do for our industry, and it's been taken by most companies and ran with. So I'm made up to have had a little bit of an impact. Well, it shows the power of the voice, you know, and it shows that people haven't got no common sense, and it takes somebody sometimes to just speak the obvious, and then all of a sudden people do respond, and you know, the authority, the, those who tell stories, rule the world, and and there's a value in what we've got to say. So. This year is a little bit about being more visual and getting ourselves out there. We're hosting some talks. so And we're also looking for other people that want to share the narrative and, and want to start talking sensibly and, and presenting the story really well. So if anyone wants to start making content, give us a shout on that as well. Yep. Become part of the Green Queen team. <laughs> a bad man, again, even though it is the best nickname in town, I'm not actually the Green Queen, even though... I have been, I went to a business meeting in Switzerland and the guy's gone, you're the dodgiest person here. I was like, why? He said, you haven't, he said, you've given me a sticker that says, call me your highness. He said, you haven't got a name. You haven't got a business <laughs> or you've got an email. It's not even a web page. It's just, and people, these like million pound investors are going, your highness, what are you drinking? <laughs> the, the queen is the plant. So I'm just the plant humble servant. I'm, I'm the queen's Joey. But, Thanks. The Queen's jelly, I like it. So come back on. Uh, Barry wanted to be on the podcast, but uh, he couldn't make it this late tonight. So oh, I can't wait for Barry to be on. I'm, I'm Barry's biggest fan. Sorry, Steve. I know everyone's fucking Barry's biggest fan. He can fuck off. No bed. It's great when I don't have to speak to him. Oh, <laughs> so join us again. Uh, join us again, even if it's to dip in and out of a podcast with me and Barry. Tell oh us how God. Mexico we could, went. I could, we could bring you from Mexico. I could have like a little umbrella and no. a can. No. Like, no, we won't be allowing that. <laughs> uh, but when you get back from Mexico and you're back in the shitty weather of the UK, tell us how the crypto talk went. Uh, and a couple of weeks or a couple of months after the launch of the book and the NFT, you can come back on and tell us how we're going to change the world. <laughs> Crying, going, oh my God, I'm too forward thinking. No, it's going to be fine. Yeah, it's going to be great. You have to send me a Kung, you have to send me a Kung Fu Panda quote in the middle, so we'll be fine. Sounds good. Vicky, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for your time. And I am sure I will speak to you very soon. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. And for everybody listening, thank you for tuning in to Podcast 234. And thank you for for being part of our little podcast family. I'll see you next week with Barry. And we are talking about, what are we talking about? Ah, yeah, we're talking about grow rooms on a budget and grow rooms if you're a millionaire. So that's a good one. We're going to build our, each going to build our grow rooms and we're going to compete who's got the best and we'll leave you to judge it. Right. Enjoy the rest of your day, weekend, evening, whatever you're doing. And I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.